we'd be walking in all kinds of revival. Come on. Let's let's say it how it is. Why is the world the way it is? Because it ain't following the Bible, right? It ain't following God's word. Do you realize there's a blessing attached to following God's word, right? If there's a blessing attached to following God's word, then that must mean if we're not experiencing that, we must not be following God's word. Amen? Now, the blessing ain't voluntarily goods, okay? The blessing is this, learning how to endure hard times, learning how to endure persecution, going through things and still living for God. Because you want to know what really tests people's metal? You want to know what really tests people to see if they're in the faith or not? It's not what they profess on the mountaintop. It's not when they're professing Christ in the harvest. What distinguishes a child of God and someone who's just going through the motions and someone who just is Christian in name only is do they fall away in hard times. Those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen? Do we understand the fruit of endurance, the fruit of perseverance is the proof that I'm not just a once and done Christian. It's proof that I'm not just one of those Christians in name only. But there's evidence that no matter good time, bad time, hard times, easy times, in plenty, in want, there's a reason your marriage vows say this, love you in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, right? Because what the reality is, is you're going to have times where you've got a lot of stuff, and then you're going to go through times when you don't have a lot of stuff. We call those seasons. Jesus said, be, uh, I'm trying to let you know, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. They'll hate you for my name's sake. They'll say all manner of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For all the theonomous and post-millennials, <clears throat> it says great is your reward in heaven. So just for all the theonomous and the post-millennials who say we're going to get all that down here. Okay. <clears throat> Great is your reward in heaven. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Am I taking his words out of context? Nope. Saying it just like he said it. Amen. Now, I'm not bashing post millennials. I love all of them, okay? Love the honest, too. Now, the reality of the is we may do in part what Christ wants to establish, but Christ will finish what Christ is going to rule over. Amen? Yeah. So let's just get that out of the way. Now, before we get to Genesis 8, and I have already encouraged you in the word that we want, we want just what I was praying for. Amen. Amen. But it's not going to happen by osmosis. It's going to be happening by the word of God and prayer and fellowship and reading and living and proclaiming the gospel. Amen. That's revival. It's not some supernatural, superimposed God the Spirit just, oops, I'm dropping this on you people who aren't seeking me, who are, who are not running after me, but I'm going to drop this on you anyway. Revival has never come to people like that. Revival has only come to people who are seeking God, living for God, and seeking diligently to proclaim the gospel of God. Period. It will not come any other way. Amen. Now, we need to pray for Matt, uh, Sister Shirley McCartney. We need to pray for her. Uh, we need to pray for Brother Dan Brown, uh, Bishop Brown from Blue Ark Church of God. His wife, Jessica, has COVID and she has pneumonia also. So be praying for her. She needs prayer. They just had a little boy like a year ago, okay? So be praying for her. Be praying for that family. Uh, be praying for uh, there was another one that I was thinking of 
Shirley, Jessica. Smith family. Huh? Smith family. The Smith family. We need to pray for the Smith family. We need to pray for the Paris family. We need to pray for uh, the Castorina family. We need to pray for uh, pray for your pastor and his wife. Pray for my family. Pray for this church. Pray for the people that go to this church. Amen. Because I think that the greatest ruse of the enemy is to tell other Christians you don't need anybody else. You don't need the people at church. You don't need to be there. You don't need, you do need it. You do need to be around people of faith. You need to be around brothers and sisters in Christ. You need, look, I know the reality. But statistically, most people at church are not reading their Bible except for that church. Okay, and when you're only reading your Bible at church and you're barely coming to church, that tells me something. Amen. That you need to be reading your Bible more. And if that means you have to come to church more, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. But we need it. We need it more. We I'm still I'm gonna stay on this. The world says less and less. I'm telling you more and more. Hebrews chapter. Is it 11 or 10 where it says, Forsake not the gathering together of the saints as the custom of some, but all the much more as we see today approach. I think it's Hebrews 10. Yeah, 10 25. Yeah, Hebrews 10 25. What's that mean? All the much more. It means when you see the days getting worse and worse, you need to be together more and more. That's what it's saying. Amen? We need that. Amen? Now, uh, if we could, I want to I go ahead and pray for these prayer requests and over these prayer requests that God would have his way in it. Uh, also, I want to pray specifically for the mission of this church that God would have his way here. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would bless each and every one of these prayer requests, Lord, that we have brought forward. Lord, you know each need. We know, God, that we have not brought anything to you that you did not already know that we were going to ask, Lord. And we know, Lord, that if you know that what, what we're going to ask for, God, that you've got a plan and a purpose for meeting those needs and taking care of each one of those people, God. We know that uh, three or four of them are saved and they are devout believers in you, God, and we ask that you would be with them that you would encourage them. And Lord, for those that have lost loved ones, Lord, who may not know you, God, who may be wandering and, and, and seeking, Lord, and, and running after other things, God, we pray that you would arrest their heart, that you would, that you would confront them in their sin, God, that, that the Holy Spirit would convict them of sin, that they would repent and turn to Christ and come to faith in Christ by the calling of God. That they would hear your voice. That they would follow you. That you would call them as your own sheep. And Lord we ask for each and every one of those who are sick or infirmed. Or have uh, medical issues God. That you would take and touch and heal all those you will God. That you would meet each one of these needs according to your riches and glory God. Not, not monetary needs, God, but you will meet them by your perfect will, for your perfect purpose, in the perfect time, God, that they would come to faith in you, that they would put their trust in you through these circumstances. Lord, we lift up those who need healing, and we ask you, Lord, for healing. We would ask for nothing else but your will and their well-being, God. Lord, we come before you for this church, and God, we ask that you would minister in this church to the people that come here God that you would build a new boldness in them that you would call out the, the, the sin that's in their life Lord that you would help them turn from it and help them to get back into your word back into their prayer closets back into fellowship with fellow believers Lord that they would devote themselves to the preaching, teaching, reading, living of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would be glorified in this church and each church member, God, that you would be glorified from the pulpit to the front door, to the back door, to all the way around the block, God. That whatever we're doing, that you're glorified in our lives 
for your own glory. That people wouldn't see us, but they would see Christ in us. That they wouldn't see us, but they would see the work of God going on in our life. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to be revived in our, in our hunger and our thirst for righteousness, our hunger and our thirst for the word of God, our hunger and thirst to live and breathe and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? I don't know if you're ready. We're in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. See, you can pray and get all worked up and not even be charismatic. Did you see that? It's great stuff, ain't it? I didn't even roll around on the floor. <laughs> now, Mike would have lost his dinner if I had done that, though, okay? He'd have been like, what? We're in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Have you been recording this whole time? Oh, good. That's awesome. Keep it on. <laughs> Genesis 8. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to dissect it, okay? Genesis 8, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The foundations of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain uh, from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually at the end of 150 days. The waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on top of Mount Ararat, or the mountains of Ararat, excuse me. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of the forty, uh, at the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It was sent and from uh, it was sent to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the water had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she re returned to him to the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. He put on his hand, uh, he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried up off of the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. And God said to Noah, go out, from, uh, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring with you, uh, bring with you every living thing that is with you, all the flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of the clean animals and some of the clean birds and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma 
The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature I have as I have done. While the earth remains seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Let us pray. Father God, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word. Lord, we ask that you would build our faith as we read your word, that you would put confidence in our heart that this is the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that would receive this message. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I want to first touch on a few minor points at the beginning here and then get to the major theme at the end, okay? But what we notice first off is that God remembered Noah. What does that mean? Did God forget Noah somehow? Did, did God doesn't forget, right? Like, I know he forgets our sin, but he does that on purpose, right? Do you think God really forgets our sin? Think about how, he, think about how it's worth it, okay? He puts it in the sea never to be remembered against us. Amen. We understand God cannot forgive, right? God does forgive. God does not forget. Amen. So God didn't just say, you know, all right, Noah, get in the ark. Go out there on the water. I'm going to go take a nap. And then God woke up from his nap a year and two days later and said, oh, yeah, Noah's in the ark. It's not that kind of remember, okay? I just want to clear it up. Uh, just for a little bit of uh, theological nuance, uh, God remembered Noah. This marks a turning point in the flood story. When the Bible says that God remembers someone or his covenant with someone, it indicates that he is about to take action for that person's welfare. You see that? All of the land having been destroyed, God now proceeds to renew everything, echoing what he did in Genesis 1. God made a wind blow over the earth. The Hebrew word for wind, rahuka, is also translated spirit. While the context normally enables the reader to distinguish ruga from meaning spirit or wind, the present verse in, uh, intentionally echoes Genesis 1 and 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's Genesis 1 and 2. Amen. Now the word that's used here when it says God sent a wind is the same word that could be spirit. Okay, the same word that they do translate as spirit. It's the same word that's used in Genesis 1 and 2 when it says the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. Okay, now this also indicates that the drying of the land, at least to me, the drying of the land is not just a natural drying up. Okay, it says that God sent even if you want it to be a wind, okay? Even if it's not the Spirit of God, God sent the wind, right? right? Meaning that God purposely began the drying out process, right? Let us understand God started the rains. God is the one who opened the floodgates of the heavens. God is the one that opened the fountains of the deep and sent the great rains from the heavens, right? God said, I will destroy man, right? Yeah. So what we understand is this is not just a natural rain. First of all, I don't know where all the water came from. Second of all, I don't know where all the water went. Come on, somebody, amen? Because even if all the polar ice caps melted today, there would not be enough water to cover the face of the whole earth. Amen? Let's talk about some real stuff, Amen? This was a supernatural event from beginning to end. God sent a supernatural flood that killed every living thing on the face of the whole earth. Amen? 
And God sends the wind. Even if you don't want to believe it's a spirit. Even if you don't want to think it's the Holy Spirit. Even though there is a grammatical connection between this and Genesis 1 and 2. Amen. Very easily could be inferred that the Spirit of God was doing this. Okay. Let's think of another way that God uses this wind. Parting of the Red Sea. God sent a wind, or he blasted his mouth with a strong east wind. You know what it said? God sent it. Supernatural occurrence. Amen? So that's what they're pointing out. Uh, you can take it as wind or spirit. Either one actually probably applies, if not both. God is shutting up what he opened. That was my next minor note here. Uh, I want to go to verse 2. Notice how it says in verse 2, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed. Well, if you go back to Genesis 7 at the beginning, it says that they were open, right? Well, we have to infer if God is the one who said, I'm going to destroy man, that this flood is coming from God. So God opened the windows of heaven, opened the great fountains of the deep, so God therein is closing them back up. Amen? Uh, I, I like how it actually breaks it down into like three separate things. It says, uh, the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained. Okay? It says the windows of heaven were closed, the fountains of the deep were closed, and the rains of the heavens were restrained. Okay? And if we think about it and go back to Genesis 7, there seemed to be three different places water was coming from, even though we didn't understand how that was working then either. Okay? And the reality is, this is not a normal rain, right? And God is stopping or putting in reverse what he started, right? Uh, next, God, uh, verse 3. I want, to, I want to get to this. Now, I want, I want to know what you have on this, Mike, because I know you've got your King James Bible over there, okay? Verse 3, it says, The waters receded from the earth continually at the end of the 150 days the water had abated. Now, what does yours say right there? After the, uh, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the water was abated. Now, right here, this statement, most people, or some people, I won't say most people, some people have taken and said, see, the water was cleared up after 150 days. No, it uses the word there, continually, okay? This is talking about process of the water leaving, okay? Because we see even, uh, well, let's look. Uh, in the seventh month, in the 17th day of the one month, the ark came to rest on top of the mountains of Ararat, right? But there was still water over the, all the other peaks and mountains. We noticed that the water continued to recede for 10 months, and on the 10th month, first day, the first day of the first month, right, or the 10th month on the first day of the month, then the peaks of all the other mountains were being able to be seen, right? And then we move into, uh, where do you go? Uh, 601, uh, 601 years is giving you Noah's age, right? The first month, first day of the month, okay, it says that the dry, that the land was dry, right? And then it skips ahead to the second month and the 27th day where the land was actually all the way dry now, right? So what we see here is at the end of the hunt, or at the end, when, it, when the water started to recede after the 150 days, right? It took 150 days for the water to build up to its highest point. What do we call that? To crest, right? The waters took 150 days to crest. So what happened was, it took the rest of that year for the waters to go away. Even with the wind that God sent to blow on it, right? 
So we see a progression to the 10th month where Noah's on top of the mountain, right? And then, or excuse me, the 7th month where Noah was on top of the mountain. The 10th month where the peaks of the mountain were seen. And then you get all the way past the year and dry ground is there. But it's not all the way dry and they wait a whole other month and how many other days before they even are allowed to get off of the ark, okay? Uh, the reason I bring this up is because a lot of people go, no, it was, it was over right there. See, it says the waters abated. But if you read the rest of the text, it explains it, okay? Let's read it from verse 4, or verse 3, excuse me. And the waters receded from the earth continually. I want you to underline that word continually. That's talking about the process. At the end of the 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now watch this. I want you to notice what it says in verse 5. And the waters continued to abate. See the process here? You see how it's continually going down. It's the process. It did not happen all at once. It took 40 days of rain. It just rained 40 days and 40 nights, right? You know what scripture said? So it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but the water kept rising for 150 days till it crested. And then it started going down, okay? Now we have the process started. We keep reading it, and it'll keep telling this process. Verse 5, the waters continue to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. And then we get to, at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark and he sent out these. Now, we don't have any more time stamps after that, okay? We just have Noah sending out birds. That's what verse 6 through 12 is all about, is Noah just seeing, sending birds out to see if there's dry ground. Now, why is he doing that? First, he sends a raven. Do we understand why he sent a raven? Number one, ravens can live in very, very swampy and flooded areas. Number two, ravens are not very picky in what they eat. Doves are. So ravens can sustain themselves on anything that's out there, whereas doves have a limited uh, food supply because they're picky birds. Okay? Now, when Noah sent out the dove, he was trying to see, hey, is the water abated? But the dove came back. He's like, well, there ain't nothing out there, obviously. Wait seven days, sends the dove out again. Dove comes back with an olive branch. So he knows plants and stuff are growing now, right? When he sends the dove out the last time, it doesn't come back. Why? Because he found the place to live, right? Because there's dry ground. There's places for him to live and be sustained. Okay? We get the final bit of information about how long Noah and them were on the ark from the very next verse in verse 13. It says, in the 601st year, in the first month, in the first day of the month. So, this is Noah's 601st year. Remember, Noah was 600 years old. And it gives you the day that they got into the ark. The second month, or the second, second month, the 17th day of the month, I believe. Because they get off of the ark in the second month, the 27th day of the month. Okay? Now, with all that being said, that's our time frame. From month number seven is when Mount, the mountain of Ararat was water had gotten below its peak and that's where the ark rested. And then another, what, month and a half, two months, three months, and then you see the peaks of the other mountains. So by 10 months, the peaks of the mountains are being seen. I would submit to you that the water started abating a lot faster towards the end of this because it only took until the first month the first day of the month for the Bible to record that the waters had receded from the face of the earth, right? 
Yet it probably was like this, okay? Let's just think about it. There was this much water. Now, Noah looked out and said, I can see all kinds of dry ground, but it was probably like a swamp. If you'd have stepped on it, you'd probably just sunk like, you know, neck deep in all this mushy, sloshy water, right? So that's probably the reason why Noah and them have to wait until the second month of the 27th day to come out of the ark, okay? But that's how long it took. It took from the end of the 150 days all the way the rest of that year for the water to dissipate. Now, why did I bring all that up, okay? Uh, number one, <laughs> the water's abated enough for the ark and everything to uh, start resting on the Mount, Mount of Ararat. Why did Noah do all this? Because of obedience to God. We also see that God's timing was absolutely in control here, right? Let's realize something else that we don't really always recognize. God did not talk to Noah this whole time. At least it's not recorded in Scripture, right? God told Noah, get in the ark. And then God tells Noah, get out of the ark. Other than that, that's all we know. That's all the conversation that Noah had, okay? So Noah probably went through some stuff kind of like we do when we're in the middle of stuff. Where you at, God? You told me to get in this boat, right? Here we are out in the middle of nowhere. It rained 40 days, 40 nights. You told me it's going to rain 40 days, 40 nights. You're going to send a flood, kill everything on the planet. Here it is seven months later, and I'm finally on top of Mount Ararat. But I can't live out here because there's still water everywhere. Come on, let's be real. That's how we'd be, right? We'd be like, God, you promised. Where is it at, right? Now, we don't know that Noah did that. I'm, this is all speculation on my part, right? What I'm trying to get at is Noah didn't have the benefit of God going, it's all right, Noah, it's going to take another 10 months. It's okay, Noah, it's going to take another five months. The Bible says Noah walked with God. Why am I bringing up that Noah didn't talk to God on a daily basis? Because we got a whole group of people in our lives that hear from God every day. And it's normally about you. Amen. <laughs> the reality is, there's no biblical evidence that God ever operated that way. There's no biblical evidence that God ever went down to somebody every day of their life and told them things. There's no biblical evidence for this. There's no biblical evidence that the Apostle Paul woke up every day going, Yep, God told me this morning I'm going to go over there. Why am I bringing this up? Because people have created this spiritual gift and they call it, I've got a word from God. You ever heard somebody say that to you? Got a word from God. Be very careful. Because Noah saved the whole planet. Hey, Noah saved the whole planet. And God only talked to him twice. Amen? The problem with I got a word from God is this. Most of the time when people say they got a word from God for you, I bet you if you can hear their voice that they're hearing, it sounds just like them. It's their own. Do you realize we got consciences, right? We have an inner man, right? You know what the Bible says? Paul said, I pray above all things that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you in your inner man, right? That you being rooted and grounded with all the other saints will be able to comprehend what is the height and the depth, the length and the breadth, to know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen? Noah was, God spoke to Noah and said, get on the ark. What? Waited a whole other year to talk to him and told him, get off the ark. Now, it's estimated that it took about 123 years for Noah to build the ark. So let's just put this in perspective. God said, Noah, I'm sending the flood and I'm going to kill everybody. I want you to build an ark. And we don't have a single other conversation with Noah in that 123 years until God shows up and says, okay, you built the ark, now get in. Why am I bringing this up? Because there's nowhere in the Bible where God showed up to every person. Like, I'm going to just use one of y'all. 
There's no, there's no verse in the Bible that would back up a claim that God's going to show up every morning and tell you just exactly what to do every day of your life. There's no Bible verse for that. There's nobody in the Bible that operated with God that way. Paul did not operate with God that way. God spoke to Paul sporadically over different areas of his life. Matter of fact, we know for sure that Jesus spoke to Paul on the day that he was converted on the road to Damascus, right? We know for sure that Paul got a visit from an angel on a boat on his third missionary journey, okay? But we don't have any evidence that Paul woke up every morning and said, hey, the Lord told me I'm supposed to wear blue shoes and a white shirt and I'm supposed to... No. No. Why? We got the Word of God. They had the Bible then. They already knew what they were supposed to wear. They already knew how they were supposed to behave. That's like somebody saying this. Now, I, I know you heard this before, okay? And I know I'm picking on people, and I know I'm picking on a specific group of people, okay? But there's a reason for it, because we've turned Christianity into this pseudo-philosophical hippie thing that it's not, okay? The reality is this. People say, when you hear them talking, when you're talking about people who need, you know, food, Clothing. Let me pray about it. Well, first of all, you shouldn't have to pray about it, okay? You either give it or you don't. You either have it to give and you give it or you don't. Amen? That's not a prayer issue. Bible's already covered that. If you see your brother in need and you have means to meet his need, help your brother. This is not a prayer issue. This is not something that I've got to get a word from God on. Amen. Come on. Give me a break with this nonsense. Here's the other thing about the people that's always got a word from God for you. You notice how God never talks to them about their life? The problem is, the people that's got a word for you, Ruth, their life's probably in shambles, and they never hear God say, hey, you stop it. Hey, you stop that. Can I give you an example? I'm going to give you an example if you want one or not. I have this girl. I'm going to say this lady, okay? She came to a church I was pastor. Her life was a wreck. Wreck. No lights in her house. Behind on all her bills. Done divorced her third husband. But she got a word for God for me. For our church. Now, I'm not saying God can't. But you think if God's going to tell that woman anything, it might be, hey, pay the bills. Save with your husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? But why do we do this when we don't see any person in the Bible do that? The only person we see in the Bible who had constant communication with the Father was who? Jesus. Right. Because even Moses only, only when he, it was only when he was on the mountain. It's only when he was on the mountain that he talked to God, right? That's the only time. He, he, do you realize how long the Exodus took? That's a long walk, first of all, okay? You ain't like we got Maseratis and stuff to ride over to Egypt in, okay? First of all, it takes months to get from, uh, was it Midian, right? Where he was at? He was in Midian. And then he went over to Egypt to go back to get Israel. And then he has to stay there the whole time with the plagues. You know, all ten plagues. And then he has to talk them out of it. And then they travel out. And then they get stuck at the Red Sea. And then the Red Sea has a part. Then they have to go a long way back to the mountain. Right? So this is a year or two. This exodus, okay? So Moses got a word from God on top of the mountain. Go get my people. Goes and does everything God told him to do. Comes back, gets another word from God. It wasn't an all day, every day, 
God's just to, why? Why do we think we, first of all, why do we think that we are that good, that special, that God's just going to give, I love you, and you're precious to me, and you're precious to the Lord, but the reality is, we base what we believe about God, not on experience, but what the Bible teaches me. And my experiences have to be filtered through Scripture. Amen? Have to be. You know, I remember the craziest thing I ever heard in my life. My, the Lord told me to leave my husband and go after this man. First of all, God ain't going to tell you to leave your husband. Second of all, he ain't going to tell you to go after a married man. Okay? That ain't God. So all these people... Oh, I have a word from the Lord. You better go on and check. Go get your Bible. You want a word from the Lord? I'll give you one right here. Right? Genesis 3. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. <laughs> Come on. That's a word from God. You want a word from God? I got some more for you. Jesus said that Moses gave you a, a, a rent for divorce because of your weakness. Because your heart is of heart. It was not this way in the beginning. And what does he quote? Genesis chapter 2. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother. Amen? Man, I get so tired. I've got a word from the Lord. Look, I, I have no doubt when people tell me I got a word from God, when they, when they say it's for me, I'll believe that. Amen? The Bible says let us work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to send you uh, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so so they can work out your salvation for you. It didn't say that. Right? Okay. So when, I when I'm when i bringing this up about Noah, this is the important part about Noah. This is the part I really wanted to get to because Noah had one word, spent 123 years building the ark with eight people. And we talked about how big the ark is. Hey, just for you guys that you are here, the ark would be uh, 25 feet taller than this roof is. And was it 12 or 7 of the sanctuaries end to end? Really? 400 and some feet long, 75 feet, or 45 feet tall and 75 feet wide. And this Huge. Is, this is the measurement of, uh, based on the uh, art they found in the mountains, right? Yes, yes. That's a big arm, okay? Eight people, eight people. All we know is that Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, okay? According to the movie, according to the movie, the, the angels don't. Yeah, yeah, that movie. Boy, I don't even watch that movie again. <laughs> Woo, that movie was bad, okay? It was crazy. They, 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 they Hollywoodized that movie oh, for sure. Yeah. They did. Now, so, so why am I bring this up, though? The reality is, Noah had a word from God. 123 years, he built the ark. He didn't have another word from God until God said, get in the ark. And then he spent a whole other year in the ark without another word from God until God said, get out of the ark. Amen? So my point in bringing this up is there's so many people that they hear from God like every day, okay? Now look, I have no doubt that God is communicating with his spirit to your spirit on a daily basis. If you're truly born again, if you're truly a born again person, that happens. But God is not, I repeat, God is not giving you a word every day for somebody else's business, okay? That's not biblical. You can't find Paul doing that in the New Testament. Amen? Let me tell you another thing you can't hear Paul doing in the New Testament. Now, I know y'all have heard this, and then I'm going to move on, okay? Amen. I don't want to beat this dead horse up too much, okay? Now, there's this new thing going on nowadays where people are saying, well, I decree and I declare over this area and these spirits, they're going to stop doing this and they're going to stop doing that. Paul, who was the chief of all apostles as far as we can, are concerned, Peter, who was the actual leader of the apostles, never operated that way. Never once did you hear Peter say, I decree, I declare, I do. You don't hear him say that. Matter of fact, when he met the man at the gate called Beautiful, who was begging 
Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. What did he give them? In the name of Jesus Christ, up and walk. That's all he said. He didn't, I decree, decree, and declare, and I bind, and I lose, and I do this. He didn't do any of that. Okay? I thought, look, and all these people that are doing it, they believe they're doing something biblical, but the reality is you can't find apostles. Acting that way. You don't see it. It's not in the Bible. Okay? I'm not against Christians. I'm against false teaching that isn't found in Scripture. I'm, I want the Bible. Okay? I made the decision two years ago we ain't preaching anything that ain't the gospel. Okay? If it ain't found in the gospel, if it ain't found in the early church, we ain't doing it. Amen? The reality is. Can God heal? Yes. Does God heal? Yes. Does God does God help his people? Does God move and intercede on the behalf of his people? Yes. But what the American church has done to adulterize and conflate and abuse the spiritual gifts and the spiritual working of the Holy Spirit, and I dare say they make the Holy Spirit their servant because they tell the Holy Spirit what to do. You've ever been in one of these church services where they say, Holy Spirit, do this. And Holy Spirit, do that. They ought, they ought to be afraid. Because none of them would look at the Father and tell, tell the Father, hey, do this. None of them would look at the Son and say, hey, do this. The Holy Spirit is God. He ain't, he ain't just, he ain't, he ain't here to do your work. He ain't even here to serve you. Jesus said he will come and deliver unto you what he's heard from me. He's come to do Christ's will. He's come to be the other comforter. He's come to be your teacher, to be your guide, to empower you, to rebuke you of sin and of righteousness and judgment. That's what the Spirit of God's here to do. He ain't here to give you a Maserati. He ain't, he ain't even here to make your life your best life now. Boy, if you're living your best life right now, you better just go ahead, because Jesus said, you got your reward. Amen. Amen. We're storing up treasure in heaven. I'm going to say that again, for all the honest. We're storing up treasure in heaven. Yes. Amen? Amen? Where moth and rust can't eat. Amen? Thieves can't break in and steal. Why not? So I brought that up for a very specific reason, though, because Noah, who was a righteous man, the Bible says Noah was righteous in his generation, found favor in God's sight. Noah walked with God. That's what scripture says, right? Yet Noah, who walked with God, didn't walk around doing what we see people in church doing today. How, oh, God told me this for you, Mike. God told me this for you, Kyle. And God told me this for Carmen. People better watch out going to Carmen that way, okay? She's too blunt. She'll tell you that ain't from God. Huh? Oh, no, you better quit. So, I'm going to get back on topic, okay? I'm just getting a lot of amens over there. So, it says in verse 14, in the 600th year, uh, 601st year on the first month, the first day of the month, the waters dried up from the earth and no removed the covering from the ark and look and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried out. So the first time he opened the ark was in the 601st year. That's the 601st year of Noah's life. On the first day of the month, the first month, the first day of the month, they opened the ark. They said it was dry, but it's obviously not dry enough for them to leave because they have to wait another month and 27 days to get out of the ark. Okay? Which, <clears throat> it varies, okay? I'm going to tell you why it varies. Uh, MacArthur says that they were in there 378 days. Uh, Zondervan or D.A. Carson say it's 370 days. Now, if you take one year, which it was the second day of the month, the 17th day of the month, when they went in the ark. They got out of the ark on the second month, the 27th day of the month. So it would be one year and 10 days, right? They were in the ark one year 
in two days. Or if you're going by a lunar or uh, solar calendar of 365 days a year, it would be 375 days. Okay? Or if you're going by a lunar calendar, which is 355 days a year, you would add 10, that would be what? 365 days. Okay? Either way, the 10 days more than when they started. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, here's the thing. How many of us can do anything for one whole year? Okay? Like, let's just think about it. How many of you started a one year Bible reading program and failed? How many of you started, I'm going to pray every day for a year and failed? <laughs> Come on, let's be real, okay? It's hard to do something for a year, so I'm sure no being in the ark with no word from God is tough. First of all, you know, with all them stinky animals pooping everywhere, okay? And, and there's only one window in the whole thing. Woo! The smell, okay? Like we talked about before. That ark was so big. That one or two people, that's all they did every day was clean up poop. And then two other people went, and all they did every day was feed animals. So they were feeding and cleaning up poop all the time. I mean, it was just like a never-ending process. Somebody had to be cooking all the time. Because they had to feed the animals, and they had to feed themselves. That's a lot of work. Okay? Think about it. Think about all the... Yeah, we don't want to think about that. I preached a sermon one time about God... Make you grow through the crack of your life. Okay? Mm -hmm. And no one knows how that looks. <laughs> Promise. Elephants. Just let, just let that sink in. Okay? <laughs> Elephants, giraffes, rhinoceroses. Okay? <clears throat> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to close. Okay? If we go to jump down to Genesis 20. So no one then come out of the ark. The very first thing Noah did after coming out of the ark, he built an altar to the Lord. And he took some of the clean animals and some of the clean birds and made sacrifice. Now I got a little note that I want to read about this because this was something that really jumped out to me. Uh, significantly, Noah's first act after emerging from the ark is to worship God. Though mentioned here for the first time, the key aspects of the sacrificial system are super or are presupposed right here. The burnt offering signifies dedication to God and propitiation of sin. The Bible says elsewhere that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, right? Now, God has cleansed all of the earth from all of the wickedness. We, know, we noted that from Genesis 3 to Genesis 6, that the wickedness of man had grown so great in the earth that every thought and every intention of his heart was wicked continuously, right? That, that's us right now. I mean, that's, that's us. You know, even after we get saved, we still got that part of us that's going, oh, I like that, and I like that sin, and I like that sin, and I like that stuff, right? Come on, don't like me, I know. Amen? Ain't a man in this room that don't struggle. Ain't a woman in this room that don't struggle. Now, some of you, you're struggling with other things, and Carmen's just struggling with me. Amen. <laughs> you got one more note on this, I want to read. Uh, da, 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 da. This is a normal aspect of burnt offerings. It is supported by mention of the pleasing aroma to God. This term for pleasing conveys the idea of rest and tranquility. It is related to the name Noah and is probably used here in order to remind the reader that Lamech's remarks from Genesis 5 and 20, uh, 29 it also has a sense of soothing. The burnt offering soothes God's anger at human sin. So although human nature has not been changed by the flood, God's attitude towards them changed because there was a sacrifice for sin made. Okay? So I wrote a little note of my own. Number one, Noah builds this altar. It says the altar is to the Lord. Okay? Number two, it's an act of gratitude. 
Noah is probably very grateful that out of all the millions of people that were on the face of the whole earth that just died, that God spared him and the six other people that were with him. Right? Second, this is an act of atonement. This is an act of Noah saying, look, we're still sinful. We're still these people, right? And it very well could be that Noah was going for everything that all these other people did. We're sacrificing for their sin too. Amen? It's also an act of worship. Do you understand that sacrifice is an act of worship? The sacrificial system, even though it wasn't perfect and even though we needed the ultimate perfect sacrifice in Christ, is an act of worship to God. Amen? Paul, it's the greatest act of worship because I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith Amen. in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was winning back humanity, but he was also creating the greatest act of worship that would ever be done. And he has been given a name that is above every name. He has been given all authority in heaven and in earth and under the earth. Why? Because of what he did. Amen. Amen. Finally, it says the aroma pleased the Lord. Why? You know, some people go, well, that's kind of grotesque that God would be pleased with these animal sacrifices. You gotta understand, God wasn't pleased at the aroma of the animals. He was pleased at the worship of Noah, who in his own, on his own, he was not commanded to build this altar. He was not commanded to sacrifice. This was out of Noah's own heart, out of Noah's own understanding of who God was and what had just happened to him. The grace that was just bestowed upon him. Noah, in an act of worship by himself, says, I will honor Amen. the living God. Amen? The aroma pleased God. It was not the aroma of those animals. It was the faith of Noah. It was the worship of Noah that was in those. The Bible says that our prayers or, you know, the altar of incense is in heaven. It says those are the prayers of the saints that go up as a sweet smelling savor in the presence of God, right? Why? So our prayers are an act of worship. Our praying to God is an act of worship. That's why we don't bow our knee to another God. We pray only to the living and one and only true God. Amen? Amen. Prayer is an act of worship. That's why the altars of Baal were such a horrible thing. That's why the Asherah poles of the prophetess Asherah in the, in the land of the Canaanites was so wicked because people didn't just go there and go, oh, that's a nice looking tree. They went there and bowed their knee and prayed and worshipped those things. Number two, God, here it says, God said in his heart. Now notice that he's not saying this to no one. Okay. It says, God said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, which is exactly what happened. Amen. God cursed the ground when Adam sinned. He said, curse is the ground for thy sake. God cursed the ground when uh, Cain sinned and killed Abel. He said, you're cursed from the ground that you work, right? And here again, when Noah and this generation when he saves Noah, God curses the ground and kills every living thing. Notice what God says. He says, I will not again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. This is very important that we get this. God then makes a covenant in his own self before he actually makes the covenant with 
No. God in his own counsel says, I won't ever do this again. Okay? Now, this last verse kind of makes people think that the earth is not going to be destroyed. Okay? It says, as long as the earth, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. But I would point out, it says, as long as the earth remains. Right? It says, as long as the earth remains. It didn't say the earth is going to remain forever. It just says, as long as the earth remains. Okay? Now, I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to read there, and I'm closing right now. This is the second one, so you can expect one more. <laughs> it's better just to give a warning, right? 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm almost done. I really am. 2 Peter chapter 3. If I can get my Bible to turn that page, I'll get there. When I get there, I'll say amen. Amen. Now watch this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Know this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they are deliberately over, uh, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water, through water, by the word of God. And that means uh, that by the means of these, uh, of these, the world that then existed was deluged, deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but it is but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, right? And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting and hastening the day of the coming of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will be melted away and burned. But according to the promise, we are waiting for new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, for all the people to say, oh, the earth ain't going to get destroyed. I don't know how you can read 2 Peter 3, 3 through whatever verse I just read to. And think that the earth is going to be here forever. We're waiting on a new heaven and a new earth. Now, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I think it's just going to be remade, re reformed, and you know, it's just, he's just going to clean it off like he did with the flood. But even if that's the case, the reality is the world today looks nothing like the world before the flood. The world before the flood had things in it that we didn't have or don't have today. Come on now, somebody. Let me say, those great beasts, they died in that flood. Okay? And even if it is just a reforming, everything on the face of this planet is going to be gone. It's going to be remade. It's going to be remanufactured. If you want to look at it that way. It says it's going to be dissolved. Okay? It says it three times in that, just what we read just there. Okay? So I can't overlook the fact that it says that the heavens will be dissolved, the heavenly bodies will be dissolved, and the earth will be dissolved, okay? And then you see the same thing in the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, where it says that 
the heavens and earth vanished away. Right? Since there was, there was no place for them. Right? Instead of Ferraris, they're going to be unicorns. That's right. We might have unicorns. Unicorns are in the Bible. <laughs> Why am I bringing that up? Because the reality is, what Peter was saying there was more motivation for us to live godly, holy lives. That's what he was getting at. Amen? Even though he's pointing out that everything's going to come to an end, what he's really saying is, how ought we to be living? Amen? Men were living one way before the flood, and God expected them to live another way after the flood. And Noah started off on the right foot, building an altar to the Lord, and he sacrificed an act of worship, gratitude, and propitiation, or atonement. Amen? That's how we ought to live our life. We ought to live our life every day, waking up at the altar of Scripture, at the very foot of the cross, building an altar saying, Lord, let my life be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. Amen? Isn't that in the Bible somewhere? Isn't that Romans 12? Romans 12. Dearly beloved, since we're gathered around with such a great cloud of witnesses, let's do that one. Let's lay aside every weight of sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that's set before us. We're not going to do that on our own. We need God. We need God's help. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in God's word. We need to be following the word of God. Because unless you're Noah, or unless you're Apostle Paul, or in our case, unless your sister Susie so and so that gets a word from God every day, you probably ought to be reading your Bible. You probably ought to be trying to live by the book. Amen? Come on. Everybody stand. We're going to pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this message tonight, Lord about Noah and the flood, Lord God, and what he did coming out of the flood. Lord, I pray that as we come out of the different areas of captivity that we are still in, as we walk out this life and live this life sanctified, being sanctified even more and more as we live for you, Lord, I pray that as we come out of those areas of captivity, God, that we would build altars to Christ, that we would make our lives, Lord, that you would make us living sacrifices, holy and acceptable in your sight, that we would not live our life for ourselves, but that we would understand that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Lord, that we are to live our life for Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, that we might be messengers, witnesses, of his good news. Help us to live that way. Sanctify us. Set us apart. Mold us and shape us into the image of Christ. That you would get all the glory. Lord, that we would decrease. You would increase. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.